So, a little while back, I watched Joseph Anderson's video on what remains of Edith Finch, and it made me reflect on how much I enjoyed that game and how special I think it ultimately is. It masterfully tells its story in ways that only the interactive medium of video games can allow, and I love it for that. In my eyes, the best games usually find a way to marry their story and gameplay together, creating an experience that is often wholly original and can't really be replicated in any other form of art. Video games allow us to become enveloped in worlds and characters in a more direct way than books, films, or television could ever hope to achieve. What Remains of Edith Finch, to me, serves as a prime example of a title that pushes gaming forward. It's bold, original, immensely creative, totally engrossing, and is proud to stand on its own as a game. It takes full advantage of the fact that it's interactive and provides an experience that only this medium can, in which the audience has the agency to progress the story directly with their actions. With movies, it's often said to show, don't tell. With games, it should ideally be experience, don't show. On the flip side, I feel that The Last of Us, despite how good its writing can be, and in spite of all the praise saying otherwise, totally fails to capitalize on its inherently interactive nature in any meaningful way. Now, you might be confused as to why I'm comparing these two games which have almost nothing in common, so allow me to explain. I'm not really comparing the games to each other per se, I'm more so going to explore what I see as two completely different game design philosophies. In one, we have a game that is more than happy to stand on its own merit as an interactive storytelling experience, that realizes completely what potential its medium has. And on the other hand, we have a game that is far too comfortable relying on storytelling methods borrowed from film and, as I see it, is too dismissive of the player's own agency and involvement to reasonably be considered a stand out of the medium. I'll break the video into three parts. Part 1, my review of The Last of Us. Part 2, my review of What Remains of Edith Finch. Part 3, contrasting the two at their fundamental levels and breaking down why I adore Edith Finch and why I'm mostly indifferent to The Last of Us. So the Cliff Notes version of my review of The Last of Us is essentially, it's fine. I can't name a single thing in it that I haven't experienced a better version of in another game, but on the whole I think it's mostly competent. Starting the game off by playing as Sarah, I find the interactions between her and Joel to be genuine and charming. It's not original by any means, but seeing the world in a state of normalcy before shit goes down is effective and well done. The chaos in the streets and the general feeling of panic is very well portrayed, helped by the game's grounded presentation. None of this would be as effective if it didn't at least slightly resemble reality. Sarah's death scene is very well done too, even if it didn't really get me. Troy Baker's performance is Joel's great throughout the entire game, and this moment is a particular highlight. Catching up with Joel 20 years later in the Boston quarantine zone, the condition of the world is, again, very well portrayed. Humans, as we have a tendency to do, are still fighting and killing each other in numbers. The situation is dire, between the infected, hunters, and warring factions all scraping by just to survive, there's an honest question as to whether or not Earth would be better off without humans at all. On the less abstract side of things though, the first few hours of The Last of Us, post-time jump, are very dull. The general world building is decent enough, but for the gameplay you'll mostly be following NPCs around in a very linear fashion through drab and downright uninteresting environments. It's not until about 45 minutes in that you'll encounter your first human enemies in what is an almost insultingly simple kill room. Just because we're here and I had to put up with it, let's talk about the gameplay, namely the combat and stealth. I have never enjoyed any aspect of the combat or stealth in The Last of Us. The melee combat was often very literally hit or miss, and there's no depth to it. Just mash square and you'll win most of the time. My main gripe is with the gunplay though. The gunplay feels horrible, floaty, and unresponsive. The main argument for the gunplay being so bad is that it's simply not supposed to feel good. You're ending a human life, you're fighting for survival, there's nothing about it that's supposed to feel cathartic or satisfying. I understand that argument, but I also vehemently disagree with the thought behind it. For me, no matter what message Naughty Dog was trying to get across with this design decision, I still primarily see it as a bad design decision that adds an unnecessary amount of frustration to proceedings. Anytime I was in a shootout, the one thing that was at the forefront of my mind wasn't, wow, this really makes me reconsider my actions and regret being so unnecessarily violent, it was usually, fuck, this game's shooting feels atrocious. Maybe I'm just too simple-minded, but anything in a game that's designed to feel unsatisfying usually just feels unsatisfying to me, and the end result is that I don't care about the thought behind it because, first and foremost, it's not enjoyable on a surface level and is often an active hindrance to any engagement on my part. The stealth doesn't fare much better for me. Most times it just felt like rigorous trial and error until I could find the right path to take through an area without getting detected. Stealth in The Last of Us also fails to be interesting mechanically. You can't move bodies, and besides bricks and bottles, there's no way to really manipulate your surroundings or think outside the box. It's essentially just avoidance. The infected, namely clickers, at first presented an interesting challenge, but before long I would let out an audible groan whenever I came face to face with a pack. Normal infected aren't very difficult to deal with at all, unless there's a clicker nearby, because as soon as one of them is alerted to your presence, 
you've got a one-hit kill hack coming straight at you. I understood that I was supposed to be careful, but I never felt that an instant death was an appropriate punishment for my mistake. As soon as you're killed, any dramatic tension evaporates. You've seen the worst that can happen, and you're likely not going to be as phased by it later on. This is all before mentioning how inconsistent the AI can be, both for companions and enemies. Frequently, the partner AI would run around an area I was trying to sneak through and walk right into an enemy's line of sight, destroying my immersion. Thankfully, Naughty Dog thought ahead and prevented the partner AI from getting the player detected on their own, but this brings up a whole host of other issues. It often rips you right out of the experience and kills any tension that the AI is so brazen and unrefined. Enemy AI feels extremely unbalanced too. By that I mean they shifted from feeling way too stupid to being almost omniscient. There were times that I felt I definitely shouldn't have gotten away with something, and other times where I was snuffed out in a blatantly unfair manner. The partner AI could also be excessively loud during sections involving clickers. Clickers are supposed to have very sensitive hearing, meaning that even crouch walking too fast will alert them. This doesn't apply to the partner AI, however, as they'll stomp around as fast and loud as they want without triggering the clickers. It's absurd, and it actively breaks tension and shatters immersion. Either the AI should have been polished up, or the sound design should have been reconfigured. A stealth takedown is surprisingly loud. And it's especially jarring when it happens right next to a clicker. This obviously hampers immersion as well. Aside from how wonky it is during stealth sequences, the sound design is overall great. Guns sound appropriately punchy, and on the whole, it's another aspect of the game that benefits greatly from being based in reality. Despite the gameplay itself feeling like an afterthought, certain mechanics are inventive and well-designed individually. I've always liked the backpack system. It's a perfect compromise between a two-weapon limit and holding all weapons at once. It's an easy system to navigate and get the hang of, and it works perfectly in the game's world. Crafting is a mechanic that I appreciate the thought of, but don't love in practice. The crafting and crafting inventory works well enough, but doesn't make a whole lot of sense in a game that wants to think it's a survival horror. There is never a time where you'll have to drop an item to make room for another, more important item. You'll never have to organize your inventory. There's never an instance where you'll want to not pick something up. It's all beneficial. There are some choices to be made, namely between choosing to craft a health kit or a Molotov, or choosing to make a shiv or add a blade onto your melee weapon, but these hardly matter. The game certainly wants to think it's a survival horror, but none of your crafting or inventory choices have any long-lasting impact. All it boils down to is being a horror-themed third-person shooter with very light and oftentimes inconsequential survival mechanics. Certain set pieces do a poor job of contextualizing gameplay elements as well. The sniper section in the suburbs is especially heinous. When I first played the game almost a decade ago, my first thought was to get close and shoot the sniper through the window. Joke's on me though, since that's not the proper way to progress. It's strange that Naughty Dog would assume players know they have to enter the sniper's nest and kill him hand to hand. It's even more baffling that they left the sniper's nest looking like this. Another sequence that's inadequately explained is Ellie's sniper section. It's impossible to stealth through this area, as the game will continuously spawn enemies. You have to initiate combat on your own so Ellie can provide covering fire, because the cutscene afterward implies that she assisted. It's silly that the game wouldn't just drop the player in an active combat arena from the jump, instead leaving it to them to figure out that they must initiate a firefight on their own. The infected in the sewers after Joel and Ellie split up are confounding as well. It utilizes stalkers, which are the halfway point between normal infected and clickers. They have the sight of a runner, but the hearing of a clicker, making them extremely difficult to sneak past. This wouldn't be a problem if the game bothered to explain this at any point prior, but instead the player is thrown to the wolves without a clue. You'll probably think that these are normal infected, but you'd be wrong and eventually dead. These examples are certainly the exception rather than the rule though, and most set pieces play out well, and my only mark against them is that they're just not very enjoyable. The pacing, once Joel and Ellie meet, is steady and swift. Outside of the first hour or two, I can't point to any part of the game that I feel drags. The plot itself, what happens in the game on a large scale, I find to be completely uninspired. Even when I first played the game as a teenager, I was mentally ticking off cliches throughout the campaign. We've got the immune person, the resistance faction, the isolated lunatic, the small community on the uptick, and more. I think small stories told throughout the world are more interesting than the main overarching plot, namely Ish's community and the sewers. Of course, it's natural that all stories borrow elements from other works of fiction, but The Last of Us fails to do anything truly original with its world. It's less of a problem than I'm making it seem, mostly because Joel and Ellie's relationship takes center stage above all else, but I still think Naughty Dog should have strived to make their world and the overarching plot less generic. The story, though, as in what characters do and how things affect them, I think is great. Mostly. Joel and Ellie's relationship is believable, and they're both well-realized and likable individually as well as together. Their relationship evolves in believable ways, but a lot of it is, I feel, a trick. Allow me to demonstrate. 
Now, I would be lying if I said I wasn't hesitant to make this complaint, because I can't really offer a viable alternative, but ultimately I feel it's a bit cheap that the game can just write itself out of any interesting conflict like this. The game needed to portray that Joel and Ellie grow close, and it wouldn't be believable if the game only took place over the span of a few days. I do like that the game takes place over the span of an entire year, as it allows for a ton of varied characters and environments, but I've never loved that we effectively only see Joel and Ellie for about a week total out of an over 300 day journey. I realize that I'm the odd man out in this case, I've never seen anybody else criticize the game for this reason, but I'd be remiss if I didn't say that it's always bothered me. The end result is believable, but as a player I can't help but feel duped out of a lot of it. I feel that that could summarize my feelings towards The Last of Us as a whole. It could have made a great scene to see how Joel and Ellie dealt with the immediate aftermath of Sam and Henry dying, how, or if by any means, Joel would have consoled Ellie, instead of it being an optional conversation at the beginning of fall. It would have been interesting to see Ellie start to care for Joel after his impalement at the end of fall, but we only really see a brief scene of them together in the midst of him healing. Actually, it would have been great if Ellie's adventure in trying to get Joel medicine in the Left Behind DLC was a part of the main game. It would have been great to see more of how Joel and Ellie interacted directly following David's death, but it's barely touched upon. I know that the counter argument argument to this will be that all these hypothetical scenes would have severely hurt the pacing, and I understand that. I also feel, however, that these scenes being included would have given a better sense of Joel and Ellie's growing bond. Like I said before, the end result is believable and well realized, but actually getting to that point could have been done much better. At the end of summer, Joel and Ellie are starting to get along. They're starting to trust each other, as is well depicted when Joel gives Ellie a gun for herself. At the start of fall, they're not best friends or anything, but they function well as a team and they're comfortable with each other. Their relationship has improved a good amount, but unfortunately I wasn't really there for much of it. Joel tries to unload Ellie on Tommy because he realizes he's growing too attached. If Ellie should die under his watch, the same pain he felt when Sarah died would be repeated. This plan never comes to fruition though, and Joel and Ellie stick together. By the time they reach the university, they're really chummy. Joel even starts to call Ellie kiddo. Right, we're inside. Come on, kiddo, give me your hand. <clears throat> then Joel is impaled and Ellie has to nurture him back to health. They barely interact throughout winter. Sure, Ellie clearly cares for Joel and is caring for Joel, but I don't know that him being out of commission for an entire chapter is what the game needed. Spring comes around and they're practically inseparable, though Ellie is dealing with the trauma from David. The end of spring and the end of the game I think is phenomenal. Joel does something horrific, but totally understandable. He prioritizes Ellie's life above the fate of the rest of the world and a potential cure. There's also a nice narrative parallel here, Joel in the beginning of the game unknowingly carrying Sarah to her death and carrying Ellie to life at the end. It's not exactly triumphant, more like bittersweet, but I always got the sense that Joel felt he was redeeming himself. It's a great finale, and the fact that it's done through gameplay makes it all the better. The actual ending segment, playing as Ellie while Joel reminisces out loud, is fantastic as well. It's only once our perspective switches to Ellie that we see how pathetic Joel really is, though I can't really blame him. So, with as good as the ending is, and despite how well Joel and Ellie are ultimately realized, I'm still left with a burning question. How am I, the player, meant to engage with these characters and the world in which they occupy on any emotional level? What remains of Edith Finch is a triumph of storytelling in the interactive medium. It details the history of the Finch family through vignettes that artfully portray each member's demise and through exploring their long abandoned house. You play as Edith, the last remaining Finch, as she uncovers secrets about her family history. The entire game is you exploring the house and playing through segments that depict each Finch's downfall. The family believes they're all cursed and doomed to die in increasingly strange ways at relatively young ages, and it's interesting to experience all of their varied responses to this perceived curse. The house itself is delightfully strange and enormous. There's a terrific sense of this place having been truly lived in. Since each family member segment is so unique, I figured I'd just go through all of them in the order they're played in. First is Molly, who died at 10 in 1947. The family's matriarch and Molly's mother, Edie, sends Molly to bed early with no dinner and locks her in her room. Molly, out of pure hunger, resorts to eating her pet gerbil's decaying carrot, a tube of toothpaste, and finally some mistletoe berries, sending her on a trip. She imagines herself to be many animals. First, a cat chasing a bird through the treetops outside her window, then an owl hunting down rabbits, after that, she turns into a shark and hunts down a seal. Lastly, she transforms into a squid and her hunger compels her to eat two humans. Lastly, she slithers, or whatever squids do, back into her room and hides underneath her own bed. She regains control of her original body and waits for the squid to consume her too. 
She died that night, not because of a squid, but likely due to the decayed carrot and mistletoe berries. Molly's segment is maybe the most comprehensive of them all. Aside from Edith's and Lewis's, it covers the largest breadth of content and is a joy to play through. Edith, for every family member's fate she learns about, jots down their portrait next to their spot on the family tree in her notebook. You can look at the family tree at any time in the pause menu. We climb along the side of the house and enter Edie's room through a window. It's here where we learn more about Edie and her late husband Sven, and Edie's father Odin. Even this early in the game, we can see the effect that the supposed curse has had on Edie. She seems to have a grim fascination with the curse and the fame that has come along with it, fabricating stories and mythologizing the family. Next up is Calvin, who died at 11 in 1961. His segment, as well as all the others, is narrated over. In this case, it's narrated by his brother Sam, framed through a letter that Sam wrote after Calvin died where he described his late brother. Calvin had a desire to, one, be fearless, and two, to fly. You control Calvin's movement as he tries to do a full loop on his swing. You succeed, but break the branch in the process, sending Calvin flying over the cliffside to his death. The day he made it to and he did. The next Finch's playable segment is Barbara's. Barbara was a child star in the early 1950s who was famed for her scream. Her story is framed through a Tales from the Crypt style comic book that was published after her death which dramatizes her actual demise. She was called upon to make an appearance at 1960's Beasticon to perform her world famous scream. As she's practicing the scream, with input from her boyfriend Rick, her father Sven falls on a saw blade and is rushed by her mother Edie to the hospital. Barbara cancels her convention appearance in the wake of this and later that night, Barbara and Rick hear a banging downstairs and Rick goes to investigate. A few minutes go by and Barbara decides to investigate for herself since Rick hasn't returned yet. As you can see, you control the comic panel by yourself. It's difficult to really convey in words what the gameplay in Edith Finch is like. Each segment plays vastly different from one another, and the only thing resembling a gameplay loop is traversing the house and experiencing one Finch's segment, then repeating. From this point onward, I'll give a rundown of each segment and relay my thoughts on them, but trying to explain each vignette in depth is pointless. My words alone can't do them justice, and I think you should experience them all for yourself. Getting back on track, Barbara is jump scared by Rick in the basement and kicks him out of the house. Later that night, an intruder intrudes, and Barbara kicks his ass. I'm forced to believe this part of the story, since the railing in the house actually was broken through. Barbara investigates and finds the home invader missing. After hearing a ring at the front door, Barbara approaches but is caught by some whispering at the door. And uh oh. It's coming from inside the house. The comic portrays a load of monsters ripping Barbara to shreds, but this is obviously exaggerated. It's likely that she was just killed by the home invader. This segment is phenomenal. It's one of the game's boldest aesthetic shifts and it totally works. Playing through the comic panels was a delight and it's incredibly inventive. Walter is next, who was Barbara's little brother and actually witnessed Barbara's death. In response to this and the supposed curse, Walter locked himself in the family's bunker for 30 years and basically repeated the same day over and over and over again. Walter eventually realizes, in his words, that I need to stop living the same day, even if it kills me. So he breaks through the bunker's wall with a sledgehammer. Almost immediately after stepping outside, Walter's hit by a train. There's not a ton to say for Walter's segment, but it is interesting to note how he responded to the curse. Nobody else became as withdrawn, reclusive, or fearful. After Walter's scene is over, we walk through the family cemetery and scale the house, bringing us to Sam's segment. Sam was Edith's grandfather on her mother's side, and his story is told through his camera lens. You take control of Sam and Dawn, his daughter and Edith's mother, as they scan for things to take photos of on a hunting trip. Dawn is made to shoot a deer, and afterwards Sam sets the timer on the camera so they can take a photo together next to its carcass. The deer isn't fully dead, though, and knocks Sam off the cliff, killing him. It can be a little confusing figuring out what the game wants you to take a picture of in this segment, but on the whole, it's another really creative way to frame events. After crawling through a side passage, we happen upon Gregory and Gus's room, Sam's sons and Edith's uncles. If anything so far has sounded at all interesting to you, then I highly encourage you to stop the video and play the game for yourself. Some of the game's best content lies ahead, and like I said before, my words can only do so much to convey how good what remains of Edith Finch is. Gregory was an infant when he died, and his scene is appropriately imaginative. You play as one of Gregory's bath toys, dancing around and providing Gregory a show while he's left unattended. Eventually, you'll have to jump on the faucet and overflow the tub. Tchaikovsky's Waltz of the Flowers plays while all of this is going on, and eventually your perspective switches from Gregory to that of the toy frog, as you're made to swim down the drain, symbolizing... well, you get it. 
This is one of the first scenes that come to my mind whenever I think of this game. It's obviously horrific, but since you're seeing things through Gregory's eyes, there's also a strong sense of childish wonder. It's hard to put into words how I feel about this scene without sounding too celebratory, so I'll just say it it's the most fun you could possibly have drowning a baby. It's also interesting to point out that unlike every other segment, Edith doesn't have any commentary after the scene finishes. Next is Gus, Gregory's brother. You fly his kite around during their father's wedding on the beach. The commentary over Gus is seen as from a poem written and recited by Dawn about Gus after he died. While flying the kite, you must activate, for lack of a better term, the lines from Dawn's poem. I guess now would be a good time to highlight the game's use of subtitles. Whenever you're walking through the house, Edith's thoughts are displayed physically throughout the world. It's almost functionally identical to ordinary subtitles, but it's creative and serves the game well. Edith will walk through a wall of text, text displayed on items will move in correspondence with how the item itself moves, and it will sometimes move around to indicate where you need to go next. Every vignette, save for Sam's, is commentated over by something written by somebody who was close to the departed, or in some cases, like Edith, Molly, and Walter, the subjects of the vignettes themselves. I can't point to a single one of these commentaries that detract from their segment. Sam's letter about Gregory is especially heartbreaking. Anyway, during Gus's segment you have to collect the poem lines, and this eventually evolves into picking up furniture, debris, and eventually a tent as the wind picks up. Gus died in the storm. The game has a great way of reinterpreting horrible deaths into engaging and even fun gameplay sequences, all through clever framing and exaggeration. Nearing the end now with Milton's sequence, which isn't a sequence at all actually, it's a flip book. Milton was Edith's brother and went missing when she was young. Milton's tower basically serves as a reference to Giant Sparrow's previous game, The Unfinished Swan, which I think is also very much worth your time. Lewis's segment is next. Lewis was also Edith's brother, and this is the most recent of all the sequences in the game's timeline, excluding Edith's. This sequence has you controlling Lewis as he daydreams at work. His work, which you control with the mouse or right analog stick, consists of grabbing a fish, guillotining it, and sending it up the conveyor belt. His daydream, which is controlled with WASD or the left analog stick, sees Lewis being crowned a king and setting off on grand adventures. The more you play, the larger the daydream gets and the more vivid it becomes. At first it's top down, then isometric, then full third person and eventually Lewis completely loses himself and it goes first person. Once you get to a certain point, all that's left of the real world is the fish in Lewis's hand. This is obviously meant to mimic the feeling of performing a mindless task and daydreaming about something more grandiose and it totally nails it. By the end, it's likely that you won't even pay any mind to the fish you're chopping up, since the daydream aspect will probably become second nature. I perfectly slipped into Lewis's shoes and felt totally in tandem with how he likely felt. It's simply stellar, it's not too long or too short, and it accomplishes so much with relatively so little. But he's still a finch, and as such it ends pretty predictably. All that's left now is Edith's recounting of her last night in the house before she and her mother moved out. Edie leaves a present for Edith, a book she wrote that tells of how, on the night Edith was born, Edie wandered out to sea in very low tide to visit the original house one last time. See, Edie's father, Odin, originally moved with Edie, Sven, and baby Molly to America in 1937 with the original house in tow. Waves off the coast of Washington sank the original house and instead of retreating, Odin stayed with the house and died. The original house is still visible in the water. Edie makes it to the gate of the old house and sees the light turn on in one of the windows, just as Dawn rips the book out of Edith's hands. We never know how the story ends and that's the point. Edith is left in suspense and you are too. The last stretch of the game relates the last few years of Edith's life after that point. Her mother and Edie die, and just like that, she's the last remaining Finch, until she discovers that she's pregnant, as was hinted at and eventually set out right earlier in the game. Unfortunately, she dies during childbirth, and her recent visit to the house was, in and of itself, Edith's own sequence. The beginning of the game starts with the player, Edith's son, reading Edith's notebook and ends with him placing flowers upon her grave. Full circle. My TLDR review for What Remains of Edith Finch is essentially, it's a masterpiece. Even if you don't usually enjoy quote-unquote walking simulators, I would strongly recommend you play this. It's tremendously imaginative and, like I said at the beginning, tells its story in ways that only the interactive medium of video games can allow. It puts the player and what they experience above all else, and for that, I think it deserves heaps of praise. Now, let's circle back and compare how Edith Finch engages the player versus The Last of Us. Like I hinted at before, whenever I play The Last of Us, I never feel truly engaged in its characters or world. This is a complaint that might sound ridiculous to some of you, but I always felt like an afterthought in the grand scheme of things. Most likely, Naughty Dog intends for Joel to act as a sort of conduit for the player. We're meant to slip into his shoes and fulfill his role. This never worked for me for a ton of reasons. First, I'm never really allowed to express myself through Joel. No, I'm not saying there should have been a Mass Effect style dialogue system or huge branching choices in the narrative like Detroit Become Human, but I am saying that I, as the player, usually felt irrelevant. Outside of piloting Joel to shoot people or collect materials, I basically don't exist. 
Regardless of how enjoyable you find the mechanics to be, this gameplay loop is hardly conducive to any emotional attachment on the player's part. The player in this instance being me, since a lot of people don't seem to mind this disconnect as much as I do. Largely, whenever characters do anything meaningful or undergo any sort of development, it's done through a non-interactive cutscene. Despite how it may sound, I'm not totally against cutscenes, but in The Last of Us I feel that there's an especially egregious disconnect between what I do as the player and how the game tells its story and wants me to engage with it. Anytime the game started a cutscene, I felt like I was being kicked out of something I really wanted to be a part of. I don't matter. Joel and Ellie have their own motivations and personalities outside of anything I take part in, which is fine, but this is hardly a good use of video games as a storytelling medium. The few times the game does relate its story to the gameplay, the results are great. Carrying Sarah at the beginning and Ellie at the end is a great narrative parallel, and a ton is gained by having both sections be playable. Switching to Ellie's perspective at the end while Joel reminisces out loud is some really inventive framing. Ellie knocking down the ladder in spring, disrupting a puzzle you've completed no doubt dozens of times by this point, is a great way the game subverts its own mechanics. Unfortunately, moments that marry gameplay and story together are definitely the exception rather than the rule. The Last of Us seems far too eager to disregard the player and their input. Like I said before, unless the game needs me to shoot something or solve a puzzle, I am irrelevant. I don't do anything actually meaningful or substantial, I just pilot Joel from one cutscene to the next and watch the story unfold. I am an actor, not an active participant. A good amount of cutscenes end with some sort of conflict breaking out, the game giving itself a reason to let me do something. Quick, there's been too much character development and interesting drama. Instead of letting the player experience some of it firsthand, let's allow them to engage with the world the only way we know how. Combat. It's ridiculous. There's almost no way The Last of Us benefits from being a game when its story is told exclusively through cutscenes. Ellie's a great character, but she's basically irrelevant in terms of gameplay. I like Joel and Ellie, I really do, but I can't say I ever cared about them because the game never gave me a reason to. You would think if the developers wanted us to bond with Ellie, they would make her in some way mechanically relevant. She will occasionally toss a brick or bottle at an enemy, or maybe take pot shots later in the game, but beyond that, she basically doesn't exist. It doesn't help when most of her and Joel's conversations and gameplay are obfuscated by me scavenging. She'll say something from two rooms back and Joel will respond, but she never really feels present, if that makes any sense. She just exists off screen as a voice while I'm focusing on more important things. It could maybe be salvaged if at any point I felt like she was talking to me, but that's never the case. It's her and Joel's bond, and I don't factor into that, unfortunately. Let me linger here for a second and make a comparison to better get my point across. Half-Life 2 is also an extremely linear game, but in that I feel valued as the player. Many have already heaped praise on the Half-Life series for how it never takes control away from the player, and I'm about to do the same. In Half-Life 2, even though I can't alter the course of the story, I feel integral. I feel like my input matters, and that's because Valve went to great lengths to ensure that the player experiences everything Gordon does. Every interaction Gordon has with Kleiner, Alex, Barney, Eli, and the world is experienced by the player. The analogy between this and The Last of Us isn't perfect, but you probably understand what I'm saying. I never felt as though I became Joel. I never experienced anything through his eyes. How I'm meant to engage with Joel, Ellie, and their relationship is made even more unclear when I control Ellie. Before this, I imagined that the game wanted me to bond with Ellie through Joel, and although it wasn't working, at least it had been consistent. Playing as Ellie made it even more obvious how little I as the player factored into any of this. I never really experienced any of this bond firsthand, and there was too much of a buffer between me and Joel to experience it through him either. This isn't to say that linear, tightly scripted games don't have their worth, obviously, but it is to say that Joel and Ellie's story and bond does not benefit from being featured in a game like this. The Walking Dead Season 1 came out the year before The Last of Us and is basically better in every way. Lee and Clementine's story actually benefits from being presented this way. Lee, like Joel, has an established character and background, but every interaction he has with Clementine is shared by the player. You direct her, you guide her, you teach her things, and by the end, you'll likely have grown attached to her through Lee, by methods that only video games can employ. Why is there no gameplay segment in The Last of Us where Joel teaches Ellie how to swim instead of always resorting to these ridiculous and uniform puzzles? Why, when Joel finally trusts Ellie with a gun, is it portrayed through gameplay in maybe the most passive way possible? Why is Ellie not a larger factor in gameplay? Why is it that there are so many walkie-talkie sections where nothing engaging happens? How am I expected to take Ellie seriously at all when there are so many issues with the AI? Coming back to what remains of Edith Finch, Giant Sparrow understood that there would be no point in making this a game unless it did something that only games can do. You cannot alter the outcome of any of these vignettes, you can't leave your own impression on the game, and there's no dialogue trees to speak of, but you do experience everything firsthand. Giant Sparrow took great care in making sure that the player got to experience the story. The player is necessary. Edith Finch is acutely aware of what it is, and fully harnesses its interactive nature to provide an experience that only this medium can. Its emotional resonance is directly tied to it being interactive. The Last of Us could never hope to compare. 
Instead of using its interactive nature to engage the player directly, Naughty Dog lazily relied on techniques borrowed from film, and as a result, The Last of Us stands to gain nothing from being a video game. What Remains of Edith Finch, to me, does a lot with very little. The Last of Us, even with its huge budget and no doubt loads of talent behind the scenes, accomplishes nothing. I understand that saying that The Last of Us is massively overrated in a public forum is a good way to get ratioed, but I can't help but feel that the more we celebrate games like it, the more developers will see that innovation is unnecessary. Any emotional attachment you feel to Joel and Ellie is likely dependent on what they do when you're not in control which is why reviews like this have always baffled me. In Edith Finch, even though all of their fates were predetermined, I grew to care for all the Finches through gameplay. In The Last of Us, I never cared about Joel and Ellie, despite how well they're written, because the game's emotional resonance relied entirely upon cutscenes.